Whenever we host events in this room, I can't help but think of the uh, anechoic chamber, that mid-century soundproof Harvard room, and the famous story that poet composer John Cage liked to tell of walking in and hearing two distinct sounds, one high, one low. How was this possible, he asked. The architect replied, quote, the high one is your nervous system in operation, the low one is your blood in circulation. Why do I bring this anatomical anecdote up, you might ask? Glad you did. Um, well, not only because you're apt to hear some pretty distinct sounds tonight, or as Tongo puts it, look what I did about your silence, but because at the outset of what promises to be a pretty equally historic evening, in my opinion, here at Harvard. I wanted to find a way to honor uh, one of tonight's, and get lost in my text, uh, honor one of tonight's original, uh, originally scheduled guests, Anne Boyer, whose latest book, The Undying, I highly recommend. Is, is, the book is so generously attentive to the body and to the systems that impinge upon it and to the need for an entirely different system. As she says, quote, all of us with bodies inside history, all of us with nervous systems and nightmares, all of us with environments and hours and desires like the desire to not be sick. Regrettably, tonight, despite her every wish to be here to read with you, Tonga, and contact us to let us know that she is indeed sick. Um, I'm not entirely sure the nature of the sickness or if it is a recurrence of the cancer. Let us all collectively hope that it is not. <laughs> but I wanted to say that characteristically or of, of Anne's great respect for her fellow authors and as, as an arts administrator, I notice these things. And as an extension of her immense care, she contacted us as early as she could. I mean, she just, she did not want to in any way interfere with the possibility of Tongo having a good reading here. And that allowed us to invite, in turn, another astonishing artist, um, who uh, 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 Dr. Joshua Bennett, newly minted of Dartmouth, who immediately said yes. Um, quote, and this is Tongo, as is the custom, two humans make a humanity. Tonight I'd say make that three and welcome Professor uh, Jesse McCarthy. He is professor of English and African and African American studies here at Harvard and he generously agreed to give the introduction tonight. Please welcome him. And, and by the way, please let's, oh sorry, let's, let's honor Anne too. Let's, let's make it even louder. <clears throat> all right. How are y'all doing tonight? Good. All right. Good. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank our guests, the poets who are here with us this evening. I want to thank Tongo Eisen Martin, and I want to thank Joshua Bennett um, for coming to be with us and to share their work. I also want to thank um, the folks at Harvard Bookstore and also here at, La, uh, here at Lamont, um, and Mary Graham especially for helping to organize the event and for inviting me and giving me the opportunity um, to introduce our guests. Last spring, I had the great privilege and pleasure of teaching a lecture course I call Introduction to Black Poetry. It's a course that I had the freedom to design from the ground up, and I modeled it uh, right down to the title on a course uh, that was taught by Professor Andrea Rushing, uh, who was the first woman, uh, black woman to be tenured at Amherst College. Um, and I took that course with her uh, as a freshman uh, at Amherst in 2003. That course changed my life. It opened up vistas and gave me a sense of a tradition that prior to that moment I had only really had superficial 
glimpses of. When I taught, when I teach Introduction to Black Poetry, uh, one of the things I'm hoping to do is to give my students that same rush of revelation that I had, to help them to see the connection between the long history of poetic practice that has come before us and to connect it to the sparks of that living tradition that are all around us. But not just in books. For them to see those sparks in the world that they live in, to experience poetry not only in readings on campuses and in bookstores, which are important, but to see it on the street corner, at the barber shop, in private conversations, hushed gatherings, sudden exclamations and exhortations in the evening, on the side of a road, or as Etheridge Knight saw in jails and prisons where a different kind of gaze might allow the prisoner, as he says, with secret eyes and the right poetics to see through stone. I'm very proud to teach that course. <clears throat> and I must say one of the highlights uh, for me personally of last spring was when I shared the poetry of my friend and colleague Joshua Bennett with my students. I've seen Joshua light up many rooms, uh, but it gives you a special feeling to see your own students delving into his words, reacting to them with their own, uh, coming up to me after class to thank me for introducing me to his work. Being a teacher is a great honor and also a grave responsibility, but I must say it humbles me to be in the presence of poets, the people who do language, as Toni Morrison would say, who keep the creative genius of the people alive and supple and insinuating, who refresh our discourse from below, our precious lifeblood of language, which is always and all around us being turned into something stale by the powers above. We are very, very lucky to have two great poets here with us this evening who are the living extension of the tradition of Wheatley, Dunbar, Hughes, Brooks, Lord, and Jordan. And because I know Tongo is from the Bay Area, I can't fail to mention Ted Jones, great beat poet who all too often gets somewhat neglected in that section of anthologies. I've said this elsewhere, but it seems to me that what Tongo and Joshua, Claudia Rankine and Morgan Parker, and Zora Howard and Denez Smith and Terrence Hayes and so many other poets that I could name are doing is part of a moment, is part of a moment of great cultural ferment and enormous vitality that I think we're one day gonna look back on and see as something like another renaissance. An ironic but perhaps fitting response to a moment otherwise dominated by our dejected and reactionary national politics. They are, if I can put it this way, one of the best things that is happening in the world right now. I just want to say uh, a few words to their specific backgrounds. Tongo Eisen Martin was born in San Francisco, earned his MA at Columbia University. He's the author of the collection of poetry, Someone's Dead Already, from Bootstrap Press in 2015, which was nominated for a California Book Award, and the author of Heaven is All Goodbyes from City Lights 2017, which we have, and hopefully you'll get a copy if you don't already have one. Uh, which received the 2018 American Book Award, the 2018 California Book Award, and was named a 2018 National California Booksellers Association 
Poetry Book of the Year and shortlisted for the Griffin International Poetry Prize. Tongo is also an educator and an organizer uh, whose work centers on issues of mass incarceration, extrajudicial killings of black people and human rights. He's taught in detention centers around the country and at the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University. Joshua Bennett is a poet, of course. He's also a scholar and professor of English at Dartmouth College. His first collection of poems, The Sobbing School, came out with Penguin in 2016 and was a National Poetry Series winner and finalist for an NAACP Image Award. He has some exciting forthcoming work, uh, a second book of poetry, Ode, from Penguin 2020, and Being Property Once Myself, Blackness and the End of Man, from Harvard University Press, also in 2020, uh, which draws on his groundbreaking doctoral work at Princeton, where we first met as graduate students. His first work of narrative nonfiction, Spoken Word, A Cultural History, is forthcoming from Knopf. His writing has appeared in The Nation, The New York Times, Paris Review, Poetry Magazine, and elsewhere. And he's famous for uh, 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 his readings around the country, but I can never fail to mention because uh, the images of it are uh, so exciting and still to me that he uh, delivered not only uh, his reading at the NAACP Image Awards, but also at President Obama's Evening of Poetry and Music at the White House. Uh, please join me in welcoming Tongo and Joshua to Harvard. Thank you. Can we have one more round of applause for Jesse McCarthy? I've known this brother for years. We survived, man. You know, Princeton was a tough time. And I also just want to thank the Woodbury Poetry Room, Christina, Mary, and Tongo, who I first encountered as a 19-year-old in the New Eurekan Poets Cafe. And I just saw this brother blow the roof off the place. Um, and what always comes back to me is he's maybe the first poet I saw speak publicly about the ills of mass incarceration before that phrase was in the popular discourse. Um, and as someone whose older brother was incarcerated, um, when I was quite young and has been thinking about uh, the carceral state for a long time through the lens of my family, that meant the world to me. So thank you, Tongo, for being a witness um, and for continuing to just write some of the most incredible poetry in our tradition right now. All right, so since I just brought about the new yo already, I'm going to do some kind of spoken word stuff right now. Uh, this is new. It's called Token Sings the Blues. Uh, and it's inspired in part by my time on the job market when people kept referring to me as a diversity hire, <laughs> even though I had a PhD from Princeton and books coming out. OK, cool. Let's try. Token Sings the Blues. You always are almost always only one in the room. Yeah, maybe two. Three is a crowd. Three is a gang. Three is a company of thieves. Three is, wow, there's so many of you. Three will get you confused with people that look nothing like you. You get called Devin or Sheila. Your name isn't Devin or Sheila. You do your best not to ignore such casual erasure. You know silence will be mistaken for affirmation, praise even, and you always affirmative. You affirmative action, action figure. You fantastic first black friend. You first ballot quota keeper. You almost cry when your history professor says, you know, in this country, the gold standard used to be people. Funny how no one comes right out and says things like you people anymore. It's all cold words like thug or diversity hire. You diversity all by yourself. You contain multitudes and are yet contained everywhere you go, confined like there's always someone watching you and isn't there. And isn't that the entire point of this flesh you inherited? This unrepentant stain, be twice as good, mama says, as if what they have is worth your panic, worth measuring your very life against, and you always remember to measure. 
your hair, your volume, your tone over email. You perpetually sorry. You don't know why. You apologize to no one in particular just for being around and in your body at the same time you know your body is the real problem. You monster, you beast of burden, you beast and burden, you horse but human, you centaur, you map the stars and pull back your bow to shoot the moon and it's one good white eye. You are brilliant. You are beautiful. You are enough. You are everything, your big sister says. And on your best days above ground, you believe her. Thank you. All right. So since Dr. McCarthy already invoked the barber shop, I figured it might make sense to take us there real quick, if that's all right. So this is one of the first places I ever learned to think about tenderness uh, and what it meant to ask someone to make you beautiful. So this is Barbara's song. Postmodern blackness blacksmith, straight razor reshaping self-esteem, you dream in geometry unreachable by any other means. Speak and entire phrases abandon standard American etymology, hence you liberate waves from the sea. Corn rose from the cornfield, reclaim fade, so I now hear the word and imagine only abundance. Caesar never meant anything to me, but a cut so close you could see the shimmer of a man's thinking. You are how we first learned to bend language built to unmake us, accept implausible risk, some much older man, shaver in hand like a baton full of wasp gossip, asking with the grain or against. And the question feels damn near existential, given this is the only place we can live in such thoughtless proximity to another person's open hands, be held by the face, ask outright to be made glamorous, shaped by your polymathic brilliance, you bi-weekly psychoanalyst, first stop before funeral, before wedding and block party alike, you soothsayer, cooing children to calm as they sit in the chair for the first time, as still a storm as one might reasonably expect. You ethicist, defending hairlines at all cost, your vigilance keeping online and otherwise slander at bay. Philosopher king, thesaurus in the drawer, Dominoes and scotch and Barbasol adorning your countertop right above the chorus line of clippers swaying to the clamor of checkmates and offhand insults now filling the shop, each moving as if the unfettered locks of some great metal monster, some faraway watcher, and you, guardian of it all, clean as a pope. So one more poem about hair, yeah, and then we'll talk about the nation state and New York vernacular. So this is a poem about do-rags. If you don't know what a do-rag is, go home and look it up. I'm not going to explain it. But a piece of background that you do need is maybe about three years ago, The Guardian ran a piece on a do-rag history month. Now, if you're unfamiliar with do-rag history month, it's because it doesn't exist. Uh, but it is a sort of inside joke among the denizens of what is often called black Twitter. Uh, the Guardian did not know this, that it was an inside joke. So during do-rag history month, people will post pictures of Moses, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman with do-rags flowing in the wind. Somehow this was not enough evidence that perhaps this was a joke. And so what you see is this really fascinating piece of uh, long-form journalism where they're interviewing people and no one lets them know it's a joke. They just pretend it's serious. So that inspired me to write an ode to the do-rag. And this is ode, O-W-E-D, like all the poems in the new book, um, because they're songs of celebration and repair, um, especially to objects and places that I was raised to be ashamed of. Uh, because my family was not middle class, but they were middle class aspirational. So no do-rags outside the house. Ode to the do-rag which I spell that way, D-U-R-A-G, because that's the way it was spelled 
on all the clear plastic packets I grew up buying for no more than two dollars, two fifty max, unless I was at Dwayne Reed or some likewise corporatized venue. But who buys the majority of their do rags at Dwayne Reed anyway? Who would actually wage war on the do rag's good name by spelling it D E W hyphen R A G, as I recently read some sad lost souls do in an article in The Guardian? This isn't botany. This isn't a device one might use to attend to the suburban garden and its unremarkable flora, drying freshly damp wisteria with black silk or the much more common nylon rayon cotton blend. I could see D O hyphen R A G. That works for me. One could argue this version makes more sense even than the spelling I am accustomed to, reflective as it is of nothing other than itself. I have never heard the term do used in a sentence by anyone other than a long lost colleague at Princeton who once reached wide eyed for my high top fade before a swift rebuke, marked by my striking his wrist as if some large though distinctly non-lethal mosquito Surely a top six proudest moment of anti-colonial choreography. I have dared call mine in this odd and probable life I hold to my chest like a weapon. I know, I know. This wasn't supposed to be about them. You make me inordinately beautiful. Let's talk about that. Or how I'm 12 years old and the cape of a white do-rag billows from beneath my marlin's cap like a sham poltergeist. Flight and failure contained within a single body, worthy core of any early 2000s era New York rapper's coat of arms. I was lying before. Once while we sat, quiet as mourners on the front porch, my father spat. That's a nice do you have there. Eyeing the soft mess of corkscrew darkness atop his second youngest son's aging face, no sign of the good hair he prays for years to family and co-workers alike. Alas, old friend, you somehow make me even more opaque, make me mystery, criminal, dope boy on the corner of Broadway and 127th, compelling respectable people to reach for smartphones, call for backup, my smooth, adjustable shadow like policy or fire, you blacken everything you touch. Are there are New Yorkers in the building? Okay, nice, it's like three and a half. Okay, so a piece of vernacular, right, right, a piece of vernacular I grew up with was uh, the open. And when you said you had the open, what it meant basically was that uh, your parents weren't home. Uh, I never had the open, except for once in 12th grade, and this poem is about that. It's also sort of about Rilke, because that's just what happens. <laughs> the Open. To be sure, there is a certain promiscuous relation between what Rilke calls in his eighth and greatest elegy, The Open, and what I meant in 12th grade when I dialed Tiana's digits into my aquamarine sprint flip phone, said, you free this Wednesday? I got The Open which was shorthand, of course, for open crib or open house without the academic associations that attend the latter phrase. In Rilke's mouth, the term connotes a way of seeing the world as a blurring of body and shape, no discernible split between the water and its trout like broad swords soft to the touch, lending their silver speed to the landscape. I've spent years yearning to be so close to the body of another, my mind might pass like mist from me, an albatross I could shed without penance or pain. Tiana leaves for the 64 bus eventually, and I am only a boy alone in his childhood bed, watching the hours improve. At school the next day, my friends adorn me in their singular brutality, claim Tiana has me open, outlined in marigolds, my body luminous, my body barely discernible, as if I had gazed upon the edge of the known world with all my eyes and yet lived. <laughs> Thank you, Tango. Man, you're the best. All right, cool. All right, so I'm gonna read a handful more. Christina, how are we on time? Solid. That's perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna read a poem about pregnancy scares. Yeah, 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 don't worry, I got like two more. Oh, mm, that's the way to go. What is time anyway? 
the way carbon-based organisms measure decay. Okay, sorry. That was a little heavy for, for right now. Okay, so this is a... <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Now I'm feeling it in my bones. It's tough. It's racial stress. Okay, so this is a poem <laughs> called Ode to Your Father's Gold Chain. And it's, uh, it's about a pregnancy scare. It's about being poor. It's um, poor, but uh, very educated and about what education does and doesn't do. But it's also about love and what love makes possible. Ode to your father's gold chain. Since we are already on the topic, I casually mention that I think we should name the baby Ajax. And you laugh so hard that both your shoulders shake as you mouth an adamant no. Your arms waving wild in front of your face like some novice air traffic controller. You later explain that this is not only quote unquote, a terrible name, but also that it makes you think of innumerable Thursdays spent cleaning bathrooms at your grandma's house. <laughs> And yes, I know, there must be a joke about class identity in there somewhere, since the name Ajax also makes me think of that magical white dust in the cardboard blue box long before it does any ancient Greek demigod. But I tend to assume my first thought is not my best thought, as you now know well. I often attribute this fact to my sound colonial education, but I'm not yet sure what you would call or think of it. One might say that this, in fact, is a working definition for love in a time of general disenchantment, the meticulous consideration of all that slipped through the mind's wet meshwork before, minor miracles like the number of bones in a human hand, how yours unfastens like a memory when I request an impromptu waltz across the bar's threshold, and we circle one another as if swordsmen in the low light, how the next week you clasp your father's gold chain at the back of my neck. Call me beautiful in your inside voice, barely breaking a whisper, as if you can't hear the dawn roaring its way through the bedroom window just to catch a glimpse of us here, barely mortal, shimmering at the cusp of this strange and untamable world. All right, two more poems. One's about my dad, who's pretty great. But I've been trying to think a lot in these poems how to find a language for something that I don't see often described in the academy, which is um, the aesthetics of poverty. You know, like how do poor people talk about the ways that they relate to each other? What kind of language do they use? Um, and how do we really think about that in our poetics? and lay them bare. And I just think about our role as the poet to sort of explain the content of our lives to people that haven't lived them, but to talk in our own terms about who we are. So this is um, The Hurricane Doesn't Roar in Pentameter, which is a breath weight line. The hurricane doesn't roar in pentameter, and neither does the AR-15 at 3 a.m. baptizing a city block in metal the chestnut-colored boy behind the weapon's heft, no larger than my father was in the jungles of Saigon, ducking buckshot in the understory. Spooked witless he was, he says, long since broken in his own way, far beyond the small redemptions our hollow dead-end culture offers a man like that anyhow. I am not unlike him. Almost as much as forgiveness, I wanted a theory of violence, a philosophy of life at the edge of the civil, some lovelier song for the unplanned, the children of accidental birth and systemic annihilation, when the smaller girls on the block drew knives or greased the sides of cheeks so punches would slip right off, you knew there was love involved. Love discolored or forgotten, pummeled in the gut, thrown to the street like a black blag or anything else black for that matter, universal glyph of loss and excess that it is. I too was born to leather belt and brandished fist, learned language first as a trap door through trouble, a story or joke to lessen the blow. The present day is a bloodbath. We want poems that stand as tall as cousins, fight cops, tell landlords to back down or catch hands. We want poems that laugh, and drink and dance like fugitives. All right. So we got one more, and then I'll get out of your way. So this is about my dad, who, uh, what do I don't want to say about my father, strikingly handsome. So much so he would get uh, free donuts at Dunkin' Donuts 
And we would go as a boy, and I'm like five. I'm like, I don't get free donuts. I'm a kid. <laughs> he just looks great. Uh, what else? Incredibly tender and loving. Like so many black men, and there's good sociological data on this now, though he was sort of um, gone when he felt like he needed to be. I spent a lot of intimate time with my father. He would bathe all of us and cover us with Vaseline until we shone like opal. Um, and he taught me how to scramble eggs and how to take care of my beard. Um, and so I think quite a bit about what he taught me about black masculinity as a site of sort of tenderness and love that is assailed at all sides but persists nonetheless um, over and against the narratives that we learn to internalize about ourselves. Um, so this is America Will Be. Uh, it's after Langston Hughes. Anything else? Oh, he enlisted in Vietnam because my uncle did. Uh, and the recruiter told them that they would not take two sons from the same family, and of course they, they did. You know, my father integrated his high school in Birmingham, Alabama, and so I, I wrote this after we were talking about what that process was like for him, as uh, so he would constantly drop me off at my, you know, elite private school and say, I send you to that school so you could have choices, um, and I've seen things you can't imagine, but we, we go to school because we value it and because we're loved, because someone loves you. That's why I send you off to school. So his, uh, don't tell anybody this. I know this is gonna be on Harvard YouTube channel soon anyway, but the cover of my next book has uh, his face on it. So uh, if nothing else, my father, a boy from Alabama who grew up eating uh, Red River clay, he's literature now, you know? And I think uh, if nothing else, that's what the PhD and all this stuff is for. So thank you all for being an incredible audience. I'm so hyped to hear Tongo read. This is America Will Be after Langston Hughes. I am now at the age where my father calls me brother when we say goodbye. Take care of yourself, brother, he whispers a half beat before we hang up the phone, and it is as if some great bridge has unfolded over the air between us. He is 70 years old. He was born in the throat of Jim Crow, Alabama, one of 10 children, their bodies side by side in the kitchen each morning, like a pair of hands exalting. Over breakfast, I ask him to tell me the hardest thing about going to school back then, expecting some history I have already memorized. Boycotts and attack dogs, fire hoses, Bull Connor and his personal tank, candy paint shining white as a Confederate ghost. He says, honestly, probably having to read the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> he says, eating lunch alone. Now I hear the word America and think first of my father's loneliness, of the hands holding the pens that stabbed him as he walked through the hallway, unclenched palms settling onto a wooden desk, taking notes, trying to pretend the shame didn't feel like an inheritance, you say, democracy. And I see the men holding documents that sent him off to war a year later, Motown blaring from a country boy's bunker as napalm scarred the sky into jigsaw patterns. His eyes open wide as the blooming blue heart of the light bulb in a Crown Heights basement where he and my mother will dance for the first time, their bodies swaying like rockets in the impossible dark. And yes, I know this is more than likely not what you mean when you sing liberty, but is the only kind I know or can readily claim the times where those hunted by history are underground and somehow still daring to love what they cannot hold or fully fathom when the stranger is not a threat but the promise of a different ending. I woke up this morning and there were men on television plotting a wall big enough to box out an entire world. Families torn with the stroke of a pen, citizenship, little more than some garment that can be stolen or reduced to cinder at a tyrant's whim. My father knows this, grew up knowing this, witnessed firsthand the fire bombs, the clan, multiple messiahs, love soaked and shot through, somehow still believes in this grand blood-stained experiment, still prays that his children might make a life unlike any he has ever seen. He looks at me like the promise of another cosmos and I never know what to tell him. All of the books in my head have made me cynical and distant, but there's a choir in him that calls me forward. My disbelief, built as it is from the bricks of his belief, 
not in any America you might see on network news or hear heralded before the start of a football game, but in the quiet power of Sam Cooke singing that he was born by a river that remains unnamed, that he runs alongside to this day, some vast and future country, some nation within a nation, black as candor, loud as the sound of my father's unfettered laughter over cheese eggs and coffee, his eyes shut tight as armory his fists finally unclenched as if he were invincible. Thank you. You can tell by my tires that not everybody who's driven with me is still alive. Also, that I like my drinks neat, bottled, and in a bus stop. Also, that we're drowning in precinct paper, department store floor plans, and applications to the moon. We can change the color of our snot from gifted to heart attack and tell you about ashes, but where are all these angels coming from smelling like the cigarette that fills? And why is the man on the safe side of these headlights freezing up? You got nothing to say at my funeral, I'll speak on your behalf. Heroin in my smile. Mountain made a flatland robbery among some things on my mind. The last door run in the name of shared afterlife. Friday to the filter, I'm a tall tale on earth. But here's to that angel that never appeared to America in a night of dog paddle and a batch of hangovers looking for a home. You know, a liar wouldn't have lived this long. That's my humor when fences speak. Holding a pair of rambling dice that got unique tempers and young souls that say shut up about our city. I hear title must crash over a coast, why lie? The street's teeth are in pieces. There's reservoir art on the faces of stragglers. There's sad news from back home that mean we have to grow up on his behalf. Stumble back to a car full of last stand. The truth is stale, but still liquor. Mission Street would be proud of me. I'm a mural man, almost organized. Remember when my lungs would wake up last, walking all morning, if it was worth this shit? I'm three decades homeless. And reservoir art is all I ever see. And I'm 2,000 miles from my first fight. Maybe no one really survived. Maybe I wrote my first poem for no reason. You know, when a drummer is present, they are God. I am not an I, <laughs> I'm a black commons. <laughs> I'm writing my new tattoo out on bus station glass, making tattoos all afternoon, trying to talk myself into seeing the decade through. And I must really be the devil's front man, staring at an empty bus that I imagine in fact carries paintings of people. And a man drunk behind the wheel has to choose between a black and white toddler after school in America on a California street that doesn't need a name nor a California. And no one on the street has a job and therefore no one is there. I colored my oppressor's gun and dance floor for him in the same day. The joke began. The walk on the bus seats is fine by me as long as I get to the front. The joke concluded. And Tuesday is rotten soup, a downhill entertainment, a commotion in the ashtray, the day that jail quarters get filtered, the day that the planet plays flat. And maybe a capitalist says stadium seats on fire and cause it economic progress. Communists got plenty of time to finish their cigarette and lie to their boss. A killer lying down in front of a tank, I have a small statue built in my chest and also an anchor upside down in the air. Worried about the walls, I forgot that the ceiling was closing in on me too. That's my take on my alcoholism. <laughs> I'm hunched over a meal I ate five years ago. That's my take on the look on my face. Uh, Curse got a little, took another step up the staircase and for a second, I forgot all occupants of the world beginning with this house. You know, I'm an action hero of one street proportions. You know rap music is the way to count blessings. The 80s were better than this fiction. I have a piece of fence messed through my skull. I'll be half eaten my entire life, always walking beside myself with a gun in my head and another one pointed at passers-by. It's like half of me, all of you walking in and out of myself, but I'm always happy to see you. What a miraculous route you took through my threat. Honest pay, a knife in my arm. Honest pay in my chest, a broken lock on a monument. Tell you the truth, I forget what my hands look like, what I did with them, or what kind of third eye. The handcuffs cut into my wrist. 
you know, apparently too much of San Francisco was not there in the first place. <laughs> Man, this dream requires more condemned Africans to put another way state violence rises down. Or still life is just getting warmed up. Or army life is looking for a new church and ignored all other suggestions. <laughs> Or folk tale writers have not made up their minds as to who is going to be their friends. You know, this is the worst downtown yet. And I've borrowed a cigarette everywhere. I've taken many a walk to the back of a bus that led on out the back of a storyteller's prison sentence, then on out the back of slave scars, but this is my comeback face. I left my watch on the public bathroom sink and took the toilet with me. Threw it at the first bus I saw, eating single mothers half alive. It flew through the bus line numbered and on out the front of the White House. And hopefully you find comfort downtown, but if not, we brought you enough cigarette filters to make a decent winter coat. Special species of handshake lets all know who's king and what's the lights bearing a uniform cloth. I mean, this coffin needs to quit acting like those are birds singing. Rusty nails have no wings, have no voice other than that of a white world dying. Their book pages in the gas pump, catchy, isn't it? The way three nooses is the rule, or the way potato sack masks go so well with radio codes, or the way condemned Africans fought their way back to the ocean only to find waves made in 1920s burnt up piano parts, European backdoor deals, and red flowers for widows who spent all day in the sun mumbling in San Francisco. <laughs> red flowers, but what's the color of a doctor visit? There are book titles in the streets. Book titles like, Hero, You'd Make a Better Zero. <laughs> or, A hey, Fur Cold Lady, The President is Dead. Or, <laughs> Pay Me Back in Children. <laughs> or, they hung up their bodies in their own museums and other book titles pulled from a drum solo. Run here, hero. Lied the hiding place. All the bullets in 10 precincts know where to go. It's no heaven or any other good idea in the sky. Politics means that people did it and people do it. <laughs> Understand that <laughs> when in San Francisco and other places that was never really there. I bet this ocean thinks it's an ocean, but it's not. It's just Sixth and Mission Street. I don't know who's king. King of thin things, you know. Like America, I'm proud to deserve to die. I'm going to eat my dinner extra slow tonight in this police state candy dispenser you all call a neighborhood. No set of manners goes unpunished. Never mind the murderer's insomnia or the tea kettle preparing everyone for police sirens. Guided by teeth goes this country. There's a cow's mouth on the flag. A, a, a peculiar notepad holds street life dear, but the writer's not here. He's somewhere talking to tombstones about the good old days or splashing reborn water on his latest face. Or wondering how his old gun is doing in the afterlife. Uh, wondering how much death trap is in those gas station aisles. Man, it got to be a million dollars a day on this concrete island. New engine in the moon, why it never goes down. I mean, 72 straight hours of night, at least according to everyone's posture around here. At 8.30 in the morning is really 30 minutes of closing. The city shuts down for a sleepy brat race. Elevators shoe shuffle to the nearest heaven, laughing with rats the whole way up. Scabs everywhere in puddles of city and concentrated schools, in TV lit warm rooms, you know the light reveals military fatigue when it hits just right on the ties, on the ties that are wrapped around the necks of lazy white guys, empire is too easy, baby. Chant at the walls or something if you feel like it. Hey, best way for a target to move is shooting back, running for a tree line made of freeways. Wisdom says against a war machine on Tuesday, you stand no chance, but may we be the last poor men to play it safe. Cow's mouth on the flag. A politician raises his hand and the crowd shows their teeth. The oligarch raised his hand, little girls are not safe outside. You are high, depressed, and comrades in function. And 15 minutes of closing in the city has survived another black rebellion. We just paying dues by trash fires, not just anybody can set. And don't you love how deadly things whisper in a moment and people kill like feathers fall with everybody screaming inside? The writer knows that death is not a matter of dignity, <laughs> rather humor. <laughs> in a house that smells like roach races, nuclear percentages on torn stoves, I mean here life never was. It's just lazy matches and manic inhumanity, hands rushing away from life towards those. What are we doing here? Surviving for no reason in particular, because nobody gone far today. Nobody go far tomorrow. Trust me, hell and heaven cannot count. Strange gardens where secondhand clothes play and concrete wishes to be human so that it could be accountable. <laughs> where they find you drenched and drains wish to be human so that they could be worthy arms for you to die in. They greet them all, grandson. Prepare for the day when every child is calm and don't say we ghosts didn't write you a poem. <laughs> don't say we didn't dig your life. Uh, you remember the shotgun by the coat rack that everybody in the house knows how to use? You remember the tightrope made of needles for walking in between driveways and man-made best friends? Go ahead, grandson, tune this street again. Never mind this country kills musicians first. 
Broken neck night, scarred neck life. If these walls could write lyrics, they say, what's your angle, angel eyes? 30 to 50 rounds pass by on the street with no daughters. This street has no sons, just young prisoners of war in a racist city that means to make capital. And we know so much. We know it all. We were stood against walls. <laughs> Who's on the third cross around here? Cow's mouth salivating over the street. And that is the story of why we aim at teeth. At the end. <laughs> If you, if you reverse the car any farther, you will run over all the scenes in the back of your mind. Yeah, I never cared for teachers, just the patterns of their fainting spells. Uh, fainting spells induced by wall art, you know, all I'm trying to say is uh, propaganda is courage. The price sticker hides my tattoo. I treasure my problem with the world. Uh, my mother becomes from Brooklyn first thing in the morning. There's a proverb around these parts. A uh, proverb, a peasant entrance, password, writing short notes to famous Europeans on the back of postcards with ransom requests. They reply with a newsreel or a cigarette announcement. I can't tell the difference. Noble dollars, then you die inside, but only inside. They call it sleeping deeper than your stalker. And stalker's all that badge makes you, says a great spirit dressed in the bloody rags tuxedos became. Meanwhile, my punch is feared by no one. <laughs> Proud of yourself? I ask my fret hand. Porch lights is what they call our guns. I've seen this house in a dream. You know, I believe a trumpet was the first possessed object to fly. Keep going, she cheers. The draft in the room becomes a toddler. Toddler obsessed with an altar. The altar becomes a runaway train. I mean, I got a thousand paintings like these cascading down my skinny arms. Dictionaries piled up to the window bars. A reminder to the population that your blanket can work with or against you. Human reef. We would be a big human reef of concepts that finally gain a metaphysical nature and they would swim around our beautiful poses. We stopped being flashbacks, then stopped being three different people. Then I was alone, <laughs> the pistol one city away. One of the drug triangles lines runs through my head. I tap the bottle twice and consider the dead refreshed. They don't you want to rest your bravery? Don't you want to be a coward for a little bit? Back and forth to a panic attack with no problems nor fears. A man gets a facial expression. Finally, a Friday finally goes his way. His life is finally talked about happily in his head. I can't possess the body of a hermit. I must be the last of the smoke now running the other way with three blocks of alley tucked under my arms. You ever see a man get to the bottom of his soul in a car ride down a missing cousin street? Half step to the right. I mean, I took the whole car outside of history. Half step to the right. I mean, a whole pack of wolves stepped to my left. Road marker is what I call the light bulb we have for a sun. A whole civilization might slink to the sink or a chain gang shuffling next to a sucker, also known as the long look in the mirror. <laughs> a stack of money starts talking from four cities away. You know, a tour guide through your robbery, he also is. Cigarette saying, look what I did about your silence. Ransom water and box spring gold, this decade is only for accent grooming, I guess. Ransom water and box spring gold, the corner store must die. War games, I guess, all these tongues from his junk. You know, the start of mass destruction begins and ends in restaurant bathrooms that some people use and other people clean. Are you telling me it's a rag in the sky? Waiting for you, yes. We've written a scene, we set a stage, we should have fit in. You know, warehouse jobs are for communists. But now more corridor and hallway have walked into our lives. Now the whistling is less playful and the barbed wire overcrowded too. My dear, if it is not a city, it is a prison. If it has a prison, it is a prison, <laughs> not a city. You know, when a courtyard talks on behalf of military issue, all walks take place outside of the body. Dear life to your left, a medieval painting to your right. None of this really makes an impression. Crowd people living in thin air, you have five minutes to learn how to see through this breeze. When a mask goes sideways, barbed wire becomes the floor, barbed wire becomes the roof. 40 feet into the sky becomes out of bounds. When a mask breaks in half, mind which way the eyes go. You know, they killed the world for the sake of giving everyone the same backstory. We watching Gary, Indiana fight itself into the sky. Old pennies for wind, for that wind feeling you get before the hood goes up and over your headache. Pennies that stick together, mocking all aspirations. I mean, stuck together pennies was the first newspaper I ever read, along with the storefront dwelling army that always lets us down. Where the Holy Spirit favors the back room, souls in a situation that offer a hundred ways to remain a loser. Souls watching a clock, hoping their eyes don't lie to sad people. Hey, what was we talking about again? The narrator asked the graveyard, uh, 10 minutes flat, said the graveyard. The funeral only took 10 minutes. They never tell that to anyone again. You just gonna pin the 90s on me? All 30 years of them? 
Then why should I know the difference between sleep and satire? The pyramid of corner stores fell on our heads, man. We died right away. That building wants to climb up and jump off another building. These are downtown decisions. Somewhere on this planet, it's August 7th, and we running down the rest thinking one more needs to come with me. Man, what evaporated on Earth so that we could be sent back down? A conductor of minds in a citywide symphony waving souls to sing, he also is. I'm off to make a church bell out of a bank window. Kitchens meant more to the masses back in the day, and before that, we had no enemy. Somewhere in America, the prison bus is running on time. You won't lose your job before a revolution hits. Somewhere I won't be home for breakfast. Everyone out here now knows my name and I won't be turned against for at least four months. The cop in the picket line is a hardworking rookie. The sign in my hands is getting more and more laughs. It says, the picket line got cops in it. Now, I can take care of those windows for you if you want, but someone else got to go inside your gas tank. It was clear to the man that rich people would talk too much this year. Hey, why don't you go ahead and throw down that marble park bench everyone's looking up at? You know, get the fucking Romans out of your mind. And maybe a good night's sleep would have changed the last 20 years of my life. Hey, playing the instruments like punching the wall, what would you have me do? Replace the population? Give brotherhood back to the winter? Stop smoking cigarettes with the barely dead? You know they listen in on the Sabbath. Police caught the police on me. There was a white candlestick beneath my detention. I ruined the soup again, thought the judge as he took off his pilgrim robe behind the white people's door and more. I didn't get lucky. I got what was coming to me. He told, say, fight me back, the man said. Of course, to himself, washing windows with a will to live. Tin can on his left shoulder, enjoying the bright brand new blight with all party goals, both supernatural and supernaturally. Down there, what, what is this elevator traveling side to side? Like 1,000 bit of Polaroid pictures that you actually try to eat. <laughs> All the furniture on this street nailed to the cement. Hey man, cheap furniture, but we have commitment. And this morning, an essay opens the conversation between enemies. Why? Because you control every grain of processed sugar between here and the poor man's border. Because in the tin can on my left shoulder, I can hear the engines of deindustrialization. And hey, you should get in the painting, you know, tell lies more deeply. And this month, I'm rooting for the traitor. Carting cement to my pillow, here we will build them. Hi again, not talking much. Hey, why don't you climb up the organ pipe to our apartment floor? I'm high again, calling everything church, singing along to a courtyard, thanks to a horn player's holy past. Now, yeah, I'm just putting a real jacket on it, you know. Talk about a real five years. Key memories like these in the pocket next to the toll receipt. You know, that man lost a wager with the God of good causes. I mean, he stood up for himself a little too late. <clears throat> Shit, maybe too early. I can still see 20 angles of his jaw zigzagging through the cold world of deindustrialization, and there is an art to it. I will tell my closest friends one day. Uh, a lot of God can happen in three seconds. Not much heaven, though. Well, here's a man before a fight, a leave me alone type character, emerging from the penniless death of a one-way street fiction. It's just a fancy way of saying I'm gonna make it even if I have to drive backwards. All I have is chord changes and a thousand backhands. Uh, driving a street like I'm choking it. Car full of nephews, it hasn't been a sun since November and it hasn't been a street I can't choke to death. This city better back down. Hey, you see this gun on the table? It's something about staring until it all feels stable. Why wouldn't I protect everyone? All my death sleep late on me, shit. My son better be quick. My daughter better shoot first because we fall for no one. You know, we fall for nothing. Okay, the first thing you'll feel is the heat. This lady would tell me, trying to tell me about possession. Hey, drink life need is what I'm mostly hearing. Most of the world leaves me alone to breathe smog like a giant to go to jail every once in a while when the genocide kicks up in late May when politicians have too easy a time. I'm gassing backwards out of one-way street in honor of myself <clears throat> and in honor of you if you understand the nature of the world. And how long I've been just like my father, one hell of a resemblance says the anxiety of the neighborhood. Yeah, this is a crossroads or a crossroads narrative or so much crossroads. People get in the habit of turning back, turn back on to find themselves remembering me, but not my last words. A man before a fight should feel the heat. But there's nothing to keep in mind. There's nothing to remember. Really, there's nothing to be. It's just this moment, then another, then stare, then it all becomes stable, then the table lets go fuzzy and Friday's an unfamiliar face peeking in the window. It's cool to panic for a second. Composure is wasted on your worst enemies. People are marked on that sidewalk. You're the only thing life size. Everybody knows this in a wire hanger empire. When the blood stops walking, that feeling isn't father enough to be permission to fold. You better swing one more time. You know that father of yours rose from the grave and said, just give me five more minutes. He said, running water is a myth. It's us who are running up, down, and all alongside this water. And people don't rise from the grave. They're not laid down, neither. It's us who flip all around their body. So. Beware when the people all around you look like they're about to jump. It might be your time. You will feel the heat. <laughs> and when four walls demand to be four walls and the earth outside mutes, don't panic. Don't try to recreate the earth outside. Don't tell jokes to yourself. Don't even talk disrespectfully to the four walls. Instead, unclench your fist and walk away. There might be heaven. 
if you understand the nature of the world. Man, you know, from a two-floor skyline in a bandit house once talked to me, he said, young man, you are heroic and 10 years old. You are among 20 generations of friends. I mean, your friends will free fall away. They will free fall up. They will free fall the walls with fifth grade speed to industrial pain behind secondhand fences. A young man use quick knife tones, you know, be bone and brass, be last laugh music. You are always leaving. Always want change of clothes from the door, a life in escape. A two floor skyline said, you're the guy that dies in the middle. The friend more blues than skin. The face that cheap hotel schizophrenics can place with their 90 mile per hour right eyes among dry heat killers once children. Three feet high and roaming and repeating and aiming at cotton mirrors that hang on you know, breathing walls. You were 10 years old, tagging along, yawning at well-lit violence, whistling tool shop songs. You will be useful. You will be high and alone. Flying on a nephew dragon from a $20 family in the sky that calls itself just more soil. Around walls that are just walls, except these walls suggest you make wives out of highs and currency. Here the air is polite to sleepy glass and bullying walls. Young man, you will come to admit that sometimes suicide is power. Because some people live stronger as ghosts. And sometimes the afterlife empties. Billions of souls enter objects like playground bullets and abandoned door frames. Even broken glass will prove it has voice too. There are 24 hours behind your back. Look over your shoulder right now. Can you hear it? The sound of drums punching themselves out. The sound of piano parts learning between assassination attempts. Be bone and brass. Be bone enough for two souls. Be invincible again. Suffer so red-eyed red -eyed accents, a professional fingertips, gifted victim, six in the morning, beer, the first month of probation, and shout at the wall, see these words that shouldn't be home. Look behind you again. Be invincible again. Be windward. Be a sad machete. Be her son. Be a thief. Steal me back. Laugh too long and never look away. The afterlife will empty and walk you home. <laughs> Man, you know... <laughs> The first cigarette uh, makes this parking lot my bedside. The second cigarette makes this parking lot my front pocket. <laughs> Next, I hold the witness like a newborn, though half-hearted. Brittle teeth by my art. Watch how we talk in depopulated circles. I mean, you caught me, said the hangman to the condemned. You caught me red-handed. But the hangman's hand kept moving nevertheless. Biting flags eastbound and other familiar sound effects. A revolutionary would call us a landless fire. The night train agrees that these are my kids. I'm just admiring your fabric, Lord. My art is rational. Therefore, my life is in danger. <laughs> Traveling up the tap this time, and it looks, it looks like water was never here. Just jail noise and the jail noise that politicians speak. Man, this world is weak. Lost his graffiti too many times. I tell the witness, hey, all characters are in motion regardless of what that day did to your disposition. I also left that piece of good news in the ashtray next to my nickname. You know, every room has a kitchen in it. Every life has company to feed. Every room has a rumble in the corner. Eighth grade heroin in my hand, along with pieces of an uncle, a purgatory grease fire got us buried. A phone rings in 1988, and the epoch begins when a mother hangs up. This is not writing poems. This is wishing carloads well. And here comes the tap water whistling past our heads. Institution tile under brake pedals matching white watches painted on ponds for smashing grab recollections. People who are related by ballad. Hot plate failures, fishing for proletarians, the matchstick that's a draft card by the time the loner finishes sweeping the train. Also related by ballad, underpaved streets hanging like strips of film in thin air. I miss the carpentry more than the religion. I tore the tattoo out my uncle's picture and lent it to my friends, one left cross at a time, life mine behind my back. They say the child would do better upside down. The child's cake party is in the precinct, a mainstream tune playing upside down, a t-shirt with their face on it, printed on the cop's thumb. You know, 28 hours later, the headrest will do. Uh, the city rain feels like clientele. I mean, I doze on the back of a bus and woke in the mind of a three-story man. Hey, God, won't you hear it with this crowbar in your hand? <laughs> All of the world is a third floor shit. Seasons invent themselves, but we invent the underground. Cause and effect is nothing but a casual venue I once played. You know, he decided not to kill me. <laughs> he decided not to kill me like giving loose change. <laughs> hey, don't teeter now, tall man. I was nobody at point blank range. Shit, nobody finally again. Lung first, I fell. A love, then a rule, then a hate. Dance moves within murder attempts within dance moves. Uh, lean back and be celebrated by small people, he said. The clothes on my life teacher needed new patches. A sit back and disrespect it all. I've given up on counter-revolution. I said, well, then here's your weapon, little bank. Hey, that's our father you writing graffiti on. Horn players beat me up, <laughs> and everyone left the altercation a better person. 
<laughs> Knowing what you know now, would you still have written fortunes on the bottom of church shoes and put them back on the rack? How does everyone think that a rich guy is their twin? Along with other tantrums is my cue. A fortune teller half sleeps while talking about a mare treading all over the posters in my childhood room and how cold calculation mothers nothing and a vision of chess pieces and chains. He says, then my friend, you will have fear and then you will have form at the end. <laughs> Right. In conclusion, <laughs> and there were hammers in my cradle, uh, which made some people scared to check on me. Because <laughs> God would have a devil and State Street would have a resurrection and I'd be a menace. You know, a menace to veins, veins that the city protects with precinct flesh. You know, people actually work in Mary here. The sun actually comes up. Have you heard the one about ghetto dwellers? Bang, they all duck. And well, look what the heathen drug in, man. What is that, my bullet? Who is that, your son? Have you heard the one about last names? Hey, did you know that late night talk is the car door to the soul? I don't think we've been here before in some type of... Criminal heaven controlling every headlight for miles if the journey has pain. It's the way I came. My name is on this seat. Royalty among mines would beat my right hand or be a brand new hammer of wolf traveling at the speed cities and interpretations of shot men. You know, hands are the only place souls are actually found. And fists get a road trip too. Maybe you should mind me. Or maybe I paid too much attention to this black coat as I was growing up in a wrong lit room. At least the walls was nice, guys. At least I had this seat. At least I got this ocean when her words freeze and central time is up. When my family relapses in the suicidal neighborhoods and can't depend on me. When black children are sad. When there are guns everywhere. When death is here and I'm a new kind of nearsighted. And she's a new kind of lovely death is. Right to the front yard passes, people getting beat up. I say, I'm not paranoid enough. You got a taste for violence. I've winked at three funerals. The Lord gave his only begotten temper to me. Death knows me by nickname. I call her nothing cute. Lord, let me see the enemy in my circle. Let me see that the enemy is my circle. Let my circle kill me. Let me not stay dead. See, I know who I am down to the street sign. Streets pass my life back and forth, pass me under gambler jokes and cigarettes, and here I am thinking this is what you call driving at night, or this is what you call 35 miles away, freeway and all smeared all over the city. Tell me, how do you write letters with a building on top of your head, with a building feasting on you, with a thousand backs turned to your kids? Without her subtle gesture to interpret, in the middle of a backfired resurrection with a president who is out to kill you. Hey, I only got one girl to speak of still. I sleep good in August, and nobody talks back in traffic. <laughs> An interestingly handsome bastard. Had to match a violent song. I mean, I'm like a high hat on its own. Motherless, though less of a child. Project tiles become tires. Choirs suck down liquor. Five floors become audience for a dancing killer. You're just a dancing killer. Midwater walk outlined all over the state. I've seen the bullet become a cheapskate. Bodies in a bargain, handsome but hardened prison air. Spanish sales, black as well. Run tell about my level. And what you seen me do to water. And what you seen me do to men. Last of a dying group of friends. Another city ends. You know, capitalists drop 10 tons of barbed wire on my Tuesday shift. We shot back at their chimpanzee pilot for the sport. The contractor has already smoked three cigars only one hour into my court appearance shift. The supervisor likes the smell, says it reminds him of when he ran the streets. And all I remember is we shot back. A gated puppet dances alone. Bars and jigs says, I'm the happy one of Legion. Meanwhile, kids commit childhood behind his wooden plaster joints. Wire dodgers under this silly puppet. A silly puppet dancing for white heaven. Like weapon is a jacket and precinct holds Friday hostage. We go through a fossil jaw and see a judge. The tunnel at the end of the light. I sleep until I'm woke by dry cereal and surrender. This holding cell only needs a giant panhandler's palm to shake us coin men around. I'm breaking my fingers for my sister's bill collectors. Garage casket open, I mean all third world parallels kill openly. Breaking my lungs for my sister's rent, I'm the sculptor of construction dust. I miss cigarettes by mid-morning, I miss Hennessy by sundown, I miss murder by inches. Five dollar bills cherish my days always, always behind. Ain't no concentration in this courtroom, just a bunch of B-plus students living out their nightmares. How do I plead with a straight face? Two blocks up is a reoccurring cliff, along with slavers paraphernalia, along with an ordinary panhandler, along with ethnic parade history, along with an ethnic parade, along with 13th graders. But let's talk about the fact that four dead children later, I still don't have a problem beating you up in front of everybody. Let's talk about the fact that money is death. Down to my last five bucks is what I call this shoe. 10 o'clock political education is what I call this dream. I got the job is what I call this blues. Two days later is what I call a cliff. Capitalists eat until the world is blurry to them. These streets is made of saliva. And some people made of saliva too, they usually have on uniforms. While a crazy man spins round and round trying to make a record out of this mass production jungle. Hey, maybe I'll join them. Count cash and cry. These streets is made of saliva and white sheets are worn by a building in which kids are supposed to learn how to read well. 
why she's on the highway too. Another mayor needs their head on a pike. One down is just one down, but you know, if you tell all this to the masses, your teacher will pipeline you. They told me I was jewelry. No, they told me this is jungle. Well, maybe not jungle, more like 50 machine guns planted in the ground. It's raining faces again in California. What does this say about heaven? What does it say about the people you kill? Waiting lines got so exhausted, a million minds dropped all these faces at once. Man, if the fascists can read the lips of a giant talking in his sleep, we might as well make our demands in prison letters. Today was born the most important trigger finger in the world. Today I begun counting down the pages between now and a pile of books by a tunnel. You know Chicago is gonna walk out of Chicago one day. Babies that drag street signs like old toys. Today, the most important letter left prison. <laughs> Babies will laugh at flags like faces that have disappeared. Maybe I'll join them. But for now, you know, these streets is made of saliva, and we raised half full glasses to the basements that meant nothing, <laughs> and the working poor who lived there. We get shot. We get white sheets on California, where the kitchen tables like to talk as much as the walls and romance on the porch consists of hard residing. I mean, this picture, characters talk spit and know that they hard to kill. The kitchen table knows this. The porch is almost convinced that one down is just one down, man. This town is coming to town. A circus watching itself. Half distracted, half suicidal, thrilled children dressed as cops, thrilled children preaching and policing and intaking and hiring and snatching your money. Man, this town's coming to town with tough trademarks to follow. Today I watch capitalism walk on water and people play dead so that they could be part of a miracle. When a drummer is present, what is it? They are God. They are God. Um, we are having a reception for these gentlemen uh, in the poetry room, and you are all welcome, so please come. Thank you, thank you. Tongo, thank you, Joshua, thank you, Jesse. <laughs> I don't even know if this mic is on, but I, these are these are the moments I live for. This is why I do what I do. This was one of the greatest nights of my life. So, thank you. <laughs>